The standard model of particle physics is an absolute triumph of modern physics, which has been built up and experimentally verified piece by piece over the past century. It's an incredibly deep and complex topic with lots of small subtleties. For that reason, I don't feel like I can really do it the justice it deserves in a single 20 minute video. So, I'm going to start a series talking about the different parts of the standard model and how they came to be. The way I want to do this is by talking about things in roughly the order that they were originally proposed to give a bit of historical context as well as some of the reasoning of why physicists chose to go in the direction that they did. Okay, so where to start? Well, a common theme in studying the standard model is symmetry. Now, I've talked about symmetry in the past a couple of times, but I want to reiterate a bit here. In physics, if we make a change or a transformation to a system and the underlying physics of the system doesn't change, we say that the system has a symmetry under that transformation. So for example, if our system is a sphere, then no matter how we rotate the sphere, nothing will change. So the system has a symmetry under the transformation of rotations. Now, this seems simple enough, but it can get complicated fast. So let's try to break it down a little bit. First, we'll group up different types of transformations into one of two classes, global and local. A global transformation is much easier to think of. This is like when we turn our head to rotate a system or if we move side to side to translate it. Every point in space gets transformed the same way. However, a local transformation is a bit different. Here, we can transform by a different amount at different points in space-time. So if we, for example, do a local rotation, we still only rotate everywhere, but we can rotate by different amounts in different places. But this isn't the end of the story. We can again separate these transformations into two other families, external versus internal. An external symmetry is a symmetry under a transformation which can be done physically. In other words, I can actually grab hold of my system and do the transformation. This is the case for things like rotations and translations, where we can physically move the system to perform these transformations. Internal symmetries, on the other hand, are a little less clear. These are not necessarily physically realizable symmetries, and typically show up only in the equations which describe the physics. So why do we care about internal symmetries then? Well, this brings us to an absolutely amazing result, which comes courtesy of early 20th century mathematician Emmy Nether. What Nether's theorem says is that whenever our equations are symmetric under transformations with a continuous transformation parameter, global, local, internal, or external, this directly corresponds to a physical conservation law. So for example, symmetry under translations will lead to conservation of linear momentum. Symmetry under rotations will lead to conservation of angular momentum and symmetry under time translations will lead to conservation of energy. But this also means that other conservation laws that we observe should correspond to symmetries. One great example of this is the conservation of electric charge, also known as electrical current conservation. We know that electrical currents are conserved, but there's not really a clear physical transformation which leads to this sort of conservation. So we can build internal symmetries into our theories, which lead to this sort of current conservation. This brings us to our first step on the path towards the standard model. The standard model is built from the framework of quantum field theory, which automatically has the global external symmetries of special relativity, namely rotations, space-time translations, and Lorentz transformations. So presumably, if we just build a quantum field theory which has an internal symmetry that reproduces something that looks like conservation of electric charge, this is an excellent candidate for a quantum theory of electromagnetism. Okay, now buckle up, this is where things get a little weird. If we know that the symmetry we want is internal, then we know that the transformation corresponding to this symmetry can't touch the space-time properties of the quantum field. 
So we can imagine the field as living in multiple different spaces at the same time. One is of course regular space time, and the other spaces will be where we're actually making these internal transformations. Each field has to live in physical space time, but different fields may also live in zero, one, or multiple internal spaces. With that out of the way, we can ask, what should this internal space look like to give us a theory of quantum electromagnetism? Well, two particles that we know are charged under electromagnetism are the electron and proton. While these particles have opposite charges and very different masses, they do have one thing in common. They're both fermions, meaning that they obey the Pauli exclusion principle. In quantum field theory, fermions are represented by mathematical objects known as spinners. Now, the exact properties of spinners are not so important, but what is important is that they are most naturally represented as complex objects. They can be real in some cases, but their original formulation was complex. It also turns out that in order to preserve space-time symmetries, each spinner must also be paired with its conjugate. This might immediately give us an idea for a simple internal symmetry that we can use. If these fermionic fields at each point just act like complex numbers in some internal complex plane, then we should have some symmetry of rotations in this complex plane. This is just because when we rotate a complex number in one direction, we rotate its conjugate in the opposite direction. So when we have pairs of spinners and their conjugates, the opposite rotations will cancel out and we have a symmetry, at least a global one. We're getting close, but this isn't quite the end of the story. See, when we observe protons and electrons, we observe them as particles, which are excitations of their respective fields localized to points in spacetime. Since these are local objects and charge is conserved for each particle, Charges should be conserved locally. So, the symmetry transformations corresponding to these conserved charges should also be local. Now, the issue is that our theory is dynamical, meaning that it doesn't just depend directly on the fields, but also how the fields change from point to point. When we had a global transformation, this didn't matter because the transformation was the same everywhere. But when we have a local transformation, the transformation itself still cancels out for the same reason it did in the global case. But what doesn't cancel out is the dependence on how the transformation changes from point to point. Terms corresponding to these changes don't end up canceling in the theory, so we don't have a true symmetry. How do we remedy this issue? Well, we've done what we can with the fields we started with, so why don't we try adding in a new field? Specifically, let's try adding in a new field that transforms in a way to exactly kill off the leftover terms coming from the fermion transformations. If this is the case, then the total theory with the fermions and this new field will be symmetric under this combined transformation. When we do this, we end up with a conserved current that looks suspiciously like the conserved current that shows up in classical electromagnetism. But what is this new field that we've added? Well, it just so happens that to transform the way we need, the field must behave exactly like we would expect from a quantized version of the electromagnetic field. In fact, this weird transformation rule is identical to one we see in electromagnetism, known as a gauge transformation. For this reason, this type of field that we add in specifically to cancel off the leftover pieces of a local transformation is known as a gauge field. In this particular case, the particles associated to the gauge field are known as photons. Okay, one last note. When introducing a gauge field in this way, to be able to get the correct cancellations, we need the particles which arise from the gauge field, generally called gauge bosons, to talk to, or couple, to all of the particles which carry the charge corresponding to the symmetry transformation. These sort of interactions give rise to forces, and we typically say that the gauge bosons carry or mediate this force. So in the present case, we would say that photons mediate the electromagnetic force. 
Putting all of this together, we have the theory known as quantum electrodynamics, or QED. The theory of charged fermions, like the electron and the proton, interacting with photons. With this, we have our first major contribution to the standard model, and it's quite an amazing one at that. In fact, QED boasts the most accurately predicted value in the entire history of physics, that of the anomalous magnetic dipole moment of the electron, which agrees with experiment to roughly one part in a billion. To put this into perspective, this would be like predicting the diameter of the entire Earth and being correct within a centimeter or so. So, saying QED is an impressive theory is quite an understatement. Okay, so I know that this seemed like a lot to just say that QED consists of charged fermions like electrons and protons coupled to photons, but this discussion of gauge symmetries and gauge bosons is absolutely vital to understanding the standard model, and many other quantum field theories at that, since these types of symmetries make up the backbone of the standard model, giving rise to these strong and electroweak interactions. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves. With QED, we've made our first major step towards the standard model, and we have included our first two fundamental particles, the electron and photon. It turns out that protons themselves are not actually fundamental. However, our journey is far from over. We still have many new particles and exotic physics to explore on our way to understanding the standard model of particle physics.